Hello out there in Radio Land. This is Michael. This is Street Preacher's Corner Podcast. The podcast where our devotion is sometimes mistaken for an unhealthy obsession. Well, I'll tell you guys, before we get started here, this is uh, Mark Lesson uh, 33, which has been recorded. Um, this will be the fifth time I've recorded it. And we're going to see if it takes this time. Um, but beyond that, man, I've had a really good evening. Not that you asked, but I had a really good evening. So I have had... Uh, for the last uh, several weeks, I've been um, uh, buying tires for my daily driver, and I've been buying them basically one paycheck at a time, replacing uh, bald tires. And so I replaced the ones in the back because it's a rear, rear wheel drive vehicle. And then I was driving around these ones in the front that are in such bad shape that you could like, you know, they're almost transparent and they're uh, and, and that sort of thing. So I knew, I knew that um, one of the tires was going to go in the front. I just, I just knew it. It's just a matter of time, but I didn't want to swap it out, and and I, and I didn't have the money for a, a third tire, uh, so the idea was that just drive it till it blows up, and then um, put the spare on there, and then and then work towards replacing the fourth tire. Well, anyway, if you're gonna have a tire like that happen, you know, you always I, I think about things. I think about because I've been driving, uh, you know, rickety cars for my entire adult life. I, you know, I think about. What could go wrong? I think about this tire could go bad. This this tire could blow up, and it could push me into uncovering traffic, uh, which has happened. Or this tire, or the wheel could fall off, which has happened. Uh, the car catch catch fire. That I, mean, I think about all these things. Anyway, tonight the the tire uh, went out, and uh, it went out under what's probably the best possible circumstances. And I praise the Lord for that. Uh, it went out, and I rolled to a stop in front of the fire station uh, in the community where I live, and. Um, was able to change the tire out. I had all the parts and pieces with me because I was anticipating this happening. And so now I've got, uh, you know, two new tires, one kind of ratty spare, and then one that's probably going to pop uh, sooner rather than later. But we will trudge on. We will carry on. Speaking of trudging on and carry on, this is Mark Lesson 33, like I said, because uh, Mark Lesson 32 ran too long. And I want to cover the stuff in here. And so we're going to back up a little bit. We're going to pretend like this is one of those Rocky movies where the, uh, this, you know, the, the, the sequel starts a few minutes uh, into the end of the, of, of, the, of the movie before it. And you say, I don't know what you're talking about, Mike. I don't watch Rocky movies. Well, what are you, some kind of communist? Mark chapter 5, we were talking about how Jesus crossed the Sea of Galilee in order to minister to two men, only one of which is mentioned in Mark, but there are two men if you follow the, the same account in Matthew and in Luke. The mark, the mark account zero is in on one man, and I, I have a theory about that, which I may or may not share. Uh, but he crosses the Sea of Galilee, and when he gets to the Sea of Galilee, he gets to a place called the country of the Gadarenes. You see this in Mark chapter 5, verse 1. And uh, you see there, We last time we talked about this stuff, we went into the, the man that with the unclean spirits, and we talked about some of the attributes and the qualities that are listed as belonging to someone in his condition. And I begin to sort of make some application towards the larger society that you and I live in. That maybe, just maybe, there are more devils running around uh, that now than there were in times past. And that what we're seeing in our society is a manifestation of a deep and abiding spiritual condition. And we're going to get some more into that too. But we're going to finish out this, this situation with the maniac of Gadara. And we're going to start here. Um, let's see, we covered verse 5. Uh, verse 6, but when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him and cried with a loud voice and said, What have I do thee, Jesus, thou son of the most high God, I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. For he said unto him, Come out of the man, the unclean spirit. Now if you understand uh, sentence structure, what you'll realize is that the, 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 uh, the way this is worded, you have to, you have to read it kind of carefully to, to get the order of events right because because what the man says is not the opening part of the conversation the opening part of the conversation is when jesus sees this fella and he says in verse seven for come out of the man thou unclean spirit and the man's response the devil's response the unclean spirit's response is what have i to do with thee jesus thou son of the most high god i adjure thee by god that thou torment me not now there's a lot going on here but I, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna walk through it as as carefully as we uh, as we do anything, and I don't know this website's doing weird things, but um, okay. So so um, 
let's start with the basics. So here you have a man. And a man, every man, has a body. A man is not a body. A man has a body. That man has a body. That man has a soul. That man has a spirit. Uh, and it looks to me, if you want to run all the references on a what happens, that um, these... I don't even want to go down that road. Let's just say this man has a body, and that man is in his body. And whenever I think about a man inside his body, like your body being a, the thing that your soul and your spirit used to get around, uh, and this is probably a lousy analogy, but I always think of a guy sitting in like the cab of like a backhoe or a crane or something. You know, he's pulling the knobs and he's turning the dials and everything. And, um, and but this time, with this man, he's not in the cab by himself, right? He has these other entities in there with him. And so when it says... In verse 6, but when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him. So there are people who will say, and I don't think they're they're totally wrong. They're not my enemy. I'm not, I'm not going to go slash their tires or anything. But there are people who will say that uh, that that verse 6 is the man responding to Jesus, not the devils. Now, we're going to explore that a bit because I think it's an interesting thought. But I don't think it's... Uh, well, here's a, we're going to start with the idea. It says, but when he saw Jesus afar off... So here's what we know. We know from from the beginning of verse or from chapter five, the beginning of chapter five, we know that that Jesus was on a boat going across the Sea of Galilee. At the end of chapter four, they settles us. He settles the storm, and at the beginning of chapter five, he's pulling into the pier there at, at the at the at the at the dock in there there in the, in the country of the Gadarenes. And it, this we also know that this man was not at the dock. He didn't start out at the dock. He's in the mountains. Uh, in the tombs, crying and cutting himself. So, my and I don't really know that you can settle out exactly where geographically this happened and which 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 uh, which pier Jesus pulled up to or whatever. But I, it does seem weird to me that a guy can be in the mountains and see a fella on a boat. It says he saw him afar off. We've already established that people uh, that have devil possession, people that are possessed by devils, that they have, among their other attributes, they have supernatural strength. You see this even with this fellow here in verse 4. <clears throat> I'm going to submit to you that they also have a, a, a perception that exceeds what a normal human being can perceive. There's no way a guy can be in the mountains in a graveyard and see a boat out there on the Sea of Galilee and know who's in it under normal circumstances. Also, he runs from the graveyard in the mountains to the seashore so that he is literally there when those guys are still tying the boat up. And furthermore... He knows who Jesus is on sight. Now, when you draw these little pictures of Jesus for your, you know, your your children's Bible story books, they always present him as the same kind of thing. It was he's always got a white robe on, he's always got a purple sash on, like he just won the Miss America contest. But there's nothing in Scripture to indicate that Jesus dressed any differently than anybody else. I mean, well, you know, what, where would he? Let's say he was wearing the white robe with the purple sash. Where would he go and buy that? Is it like a Jesus store that only sells, you know, Jesus clothes or something? This doesn't make any sense. So there's no, so there's nothing to indicate that he dressed any differently. So this boat pulls up to the pier, and these 12, 13 guys get out. How do you know which one's Jesus? Well, you know which one's Jesus if you are a unclean spirit. Because they address Jesus by name. That Jesus, thou son of the most high God. So, so looks to me like supernatural strength, sure. Supernatural vision, sure. Supernatural speed, possibly. And then some sort of spiritual insight into the man that is standing before them, the Lord Jesus Christ. So my point, I guess, is if this was the man doing this and not the devils, then how did he see him so far off? And how did he know who was in the boat? And 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 how did he know to address Jesus by name? It's not like he had a name tag on. Well, the argument is in verse 6 that says uh, he ran and worshipped him. And they say, well, G well, a devil 
an unclean spirit, a foul spirit, would never worship God. Uh, they would. They don't worship, and they and they certainly wouldn't worship Jesus. Well, let, let's let's look at something. Let's look at let's look at Mark fifteen. So, in your Bible, uh, the word worship pops up. You know, more often than not. And the first time the word worship shows up is not here in Mark 15. It's in Genesis when Abraham is taking Isaac up the Mount Moriah to sacrifice him. That is the first time the word worship shows up. And it's used in a lot of connotations. We use, you know, we use it in the tent context of, um, we'll say if we had a church service that we worship God, uh, we worship him in, 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 in preaching and in ministering, and in singing, and in praising, and in praying, there are a lot of different things. There are a lot. Of, there are a lot of different activities that fall under the category of worship. And I'm not even talking true work, true worship. There's also a lot of categories that also fall under what what could be called categorically be called false worship. If you bow down before a stone statue, that's false. That is worship, but it's false worship. And so we tend to say, well, the devils would never worship God because that's not what devils do. They're, they're opposed to God. Um, but like I said, look at Mark 15. Mark 15, the context is the crucifixion of Jesus Christ or the trial. And starting at verse 16, the soldiers, verse 16, and the soldiers led him away into the hall called Praetorium, and they called together the whole band. And they clothed him with purple, and plaited a crown of thorns, and put it about his head, and began to salute him, Hail, King of the Jews! And they smote him in the head with a reed, and did spit upon him, and bowing their knees, worshipped him. So, obviously, this was not a sincere thing they were doing. This was not done out of devotion to the Lord Jesus Christ. This was not done to honor him, or bring glory to him. This was done as a form of mockery, and the Bible still categorizes that as worship. Because apparently there is a form of worship that is mockery that is still worship. And it may not be proper worship. It may not be real worship. It may not be appropriate worship, but it's still worship. And yes, I realize what a can of worms that opens up. So apparently the Bible definition of worship is is broad enough to include we, we would say we would say that proper worship is attention or devotion or 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 yeah attention or devotion given to God. I think it's a fair working definition of the word worship. But I submit to you that the Bible usage of the word includes negative attention, negative devotion, negative fixation on God, or anything else. Now we don't have to guess. We don't have to. We don't have to guess whether or not this was this was a uh, mocking sort of worship or devoted kind of worship, honoring kind of, we don't have to guess because the Bible literally quotes the devils. What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou son of the most high God? So he or it or they, however you want to, however you want to lay that out. Um, let me just say that it is a little weird how, how the pronouns, pronouns are in this in this passage, and I'll tell you why. If you if you if you listen to us for any length of time, um, I apologize. But if you've lengthened listened to us for any length of time, what you have heard me say at least once or twice is that when you go through your Bible, uh, the pronouns that start with a T, like thee, thine, thou, you know the things that twenty first century Americans say they can't understand. Thee, thine, thou. Uh, if it starts with a T and it's a pronoun, it is a singular pronoun. So I'm speaking to one person, I would say thee, or thou, or thine. If there's a plural situation where I'm talking to a group of people, addressing a crowd or speaking to more than one person, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a pronoun starts with a Y. Ye, you, yours. And that is actually more precise than your modern English language. 
You can tell by looking at a verse, by a passage, whether or not Jesus or anybody else is talking to one person or a group of people. But here in this passage, it jumps back and forth, even in the same sentence. Here you have a pluralistic entity, which we'll get to in a second. And that pluralistic entity uses singular pronouns for itself or themselves or they selves or whatever the right word is. And so does Jesus when speaking to this entity. And it's, it, it's, it's more uh, than a little weird. But anyway, he or it or they, they believed that Jesus was coming to torment them. And they weren't snarling and they weren't mocking and they weren't pushing back and they weren't sassing Jesus. They understood that whatever he had come to do to them, they could not stop him from doing it. And it's interesting when you get into the Bible, when you get into horror movies and, and exorcisms about horror, or horror movies about exorcisms or stories about exorcisms, it is interesting how often the possessed person mocks the uh, exorcist or resists the exorcist. And I think that's interesting because you don't see that in the Bible. You don't see where the possess where you got to go in there for days and chant stuff in Latin and swing smoke around and throw holy water and, and do all these gyrations and nonsense. You don't see any of that. What you see, whether it's an apostle or whether it's the Lord Jesus Christ himself, is these devils understand that when the proper authority shows up on the scene, they got to go. And so what they, 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 they don't come at Jesus snarling or mocking or laughing. They come at Jesus begging. And that's interesting. Now, we, we, we've been avoiding this. We've got to go here. Look at Luke 8. Just because i got to cover it. Luke 8, um, we talked about the, the attributes of devilish behavior, devilish influence. I'd made this statement before, and I'll make it again in case you didn't listen the first time, uh, that as your society becomes more God-dishonoring and more paganistic and more, as we get closer and closer to the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible says that evil men and sed seducers shall wax worse and worse. So I think you can expect an increase in the effect of devils, the presence of devils, the influence of devils on your general world, and the behavior that you see amongst, in the Bible, amongst possessed people, you can expect to see more of that in the world and the country you live in. And I would give, and I, and I, I use the, the fierceness as an example. I use the, the, the supernatural strength as an example. I use the fixation with death as an example. I use the fixation with false worship as an example. I went through all this in the previous installment here. But what I did not get to is what you see in Luke 8, verse 27. And he went forth uh, to land. There met him out of the city a certain man, which had devils a long time, and wore no clothes, neither abode in any house but in the tombs. I want to make a statement. You can, you can think I'm right or think I'm wrong. But the more God dishonoring a society becomes, uh, weather permitting, as, as Darnell says, the less clothes they wear. And that is a very general statement, but I think it bears itself out. And I think if you've been outside lately, uh, you'll, you, you know, if you've looked around, uh, immodesty is a problem in your society. Immodesty is a problem in our churches. And I think you're going to see more and more and more of that um, as the days go on, because what you see in your society is more and more devilish influence. It's a strange thing. You know, we, we go preach all over the place, and I don't know, a couple times a year maybe. It depends on the venue. Uh, a couple times a year we'll say, uh, people will expose themselves while we preach. It's, it, I, I've never understood what they get out of it. I've never understood what they're hoping to accomplish. I've never understood who they're hoping to impress. Uh, we were in uh, Savannah during the St. Patrick's Day Parade. Sorry, I'm struggling with some technical difficulties here. Uh, we were in Savannah during the St. Patrick's Day Parade, and a guy came up and wanted to take his picture with the banner, and that happens, that happens uh, a lot. I mean, a lot, a lot. And uh, so he says, can I take your picture? Most of the time they don't ask. And they certainly don't have to ask. 
That's better. Uh, they certainly don't have to ask, but this guy did. And because he did, I said, well, can I? I said, you can take a picture. I can't stop you. Uh, I said, but, but um, can you email me the picture? Because I get these pictures taken all the time. I never get to see them. He said, sure, give me your email address. So I gave him my email address. He takes a picture. He hands the camera off to somebody else. They take the picture. He gets a young lady to walk up there, and I guess his girlfriend. I'm assuming it's his girlfriend. And she gets in front of us, and she lifts up her shirt, and they take another picture. And I thought to myself, I wonder which picture he's going to send me. I'm hoping it's the first one and not the second one. And I was so concerned about this that I actually I had my wife open up the email uh, because I, I just don't need those kind of problems in my life. But it is interesting to me that, that it, and this, this has been a fairly recent thing that I've observed that people will expose themselves, and I don't know why. I don't know why you would, uh, you know, do that. And I don't know why you would photograph yourself doing it. And I don't know who you send these pictures to when you're done. And so when you look at this irrational behavior, uh, the only conclusion I can come to is devils. And, and, you know, I, I saw a picture somebody had sent me. I, was, I wish I'd kept it. I don't know. Uh, so it showed this, uh, these two groups of people uh, in two stages of life. And so the first picture was these, these, these uh, you know, people out on the Papua New Guinea or someplace like that. And it was a picture of them before the missionary got there. And they're all running around loincloths with bones in their noses and everything, paint, all painted up. And then it showed a, a few years later after the missionary had been there. And they, were, they had clothes on and they'd taken all this all this paraphernalia out of their face. And it's, you know, the idea was that here's people that were in darkness and came to light and you see the change in their lives. Then the second set of pictures was a picture of America. A, a, I guess it was actually a drawing, a woodcut kind of drawing of Americans from a hundred years ago or so. And they were all, you know, dressed and they were listening to a man preach out in public. And then it showed today and you got people that are naked and pierced up and, and, and they look, They've taken on the attributes of a paganistic society. And the idea was that here's people that had light and then embraced darkness. And so that's that's something to think about. Now, we got to get back over to Mark 5. Now, going on to verse 8. Uh, like I said, we, we'd understand that verse 8 explains verse 7. Jesus has come out and the devils, you know, they... they, they they, they, they panic. In verse 9, like I said, uh, it says, And he asked him, he, singular, asked him, singular, What is thy singular name? And he, singular, answered, My singular name is, singular, legion, for we, plural, are many. Let me read that again with all that editorial comment. And he asked him, what is thy name? And he answered, my name is Legion, for we are many. It doesn't say our name is Legion, or, or I mean, that would be, that would make sense to me grammatically, uh, how that would work. And so that whole thing is very odd. Uh, but let me tell you something else that's odd, that I don't know, that I, this is one of those things, let me just park here for just a second and point out something so obvious that most people uh, just roll right past it. So I talked about my, my, the way I picture the the man inside that body, that he is sitting there at the cab and he's got this, the controls, he's got the knobs and the levers, and, and a man operates his body from the inside. Right? I mean, this is like, no, no kidding, Mike. No kidding. What else would you do? Well, I, I don't know if you've ever watched a baby. I don't think people are born knowing how to operate their own bodies. I don't think they're born knowing what all those knobs and levers and switches do. I remember distinctly, uh, especially with, with my, my youngest, or my, my, not my youngest son, my second oldest son. Uh, I don't know why it sticks out with him more than anybody else, but I, you ever seen the moment that a baby realizes it has feet? I mean, I mean, he just reaches out, he grabs his feet, and he just looks with total surprise and wonder that these things are at the ends of his legs. And, of course, he sticks them in his mouth. And that's why you got to put those little mittens on babies so they don't claw their eyes out because they're inside a body and they're just kind of flailing around. They don't know what any of these knobs and levers do. And as time goes on and they get used to it, they can learn how to, you know, sit up and, and you know, walk and talk and chew bubble gum and vote Democrat and do all those great things. And, and they learn, a man learns how to operate his body. 
Okay, so you're like, where are you going with this, Mike? Well, these devils aren't people. And yet they know how to sit inside the cab of this man's, you know, his backhoe here. And they know how to turn the dials and pull the levers and to make that man go here and go there and say this. They're able to force air over his vocal cords and operate his mouth and his teeth and his tongue to be able to speak. How did they learn how to do that? It's very, very strange. They appear to be very skilled at the running of this man's body to the point they can overpower the man who naturally runs that body. And no one ever talks about that, and maybe that's because maybe, maybe that's nobody knows why. But it's a, it's a very strange thing. So verse 10, And he besought him much that he would not send them away out of the country. Now, I don't really know what the big deal is, why they don't want to leave the country. The country of the Gadarenes, I'm assuming what that is. I don't know why that is. But it, but there's two. it looks like there are two requests that they make. And uh, if you go back to Luke 8 real quick. Luke 8, verse 31. And they besought him that, that he would not command them to go out into the deep. So they don't want to be sent out of the country of the Gadarenes. And they don't want to be sent into the deep. But when Jesus does cast them out of the man... They go into a herd of swine, you see here in the next couple of verses, and the first thing they do is make a beeline for the ocean or for the sea. I thought they didn't want to go into the deep. Isn't it strange to say, don't send us into the deep, and when he sends them someplace else, they head for the deep? Now, if you know how the, like I said, if you know how the story ends, that request that they make doesn't make a ton of sense. Unless, unless it's not that deep, but some other deep. If you want a fun Bible study, run all the references on the deep, because sometimes it is a reference to the ocean or to a sea, and sometimes it is something else. My point in all that, there, there is more in your Bible than you could cover or understand in a thousand lifetimes. It is a bottomless book. book. And verse 11 says, Now there was nigh unto the mountains a great herd of swine feeding, and all the devils besought him, saying, Send us in the swine, that we may enter into them. I had a real problem with this for a number of years, just because I could not figure out why there were pig farmers in Israel. And, you know, it does say at the beginning of the chapter that this is the country of the Gadarenes. We know he's still geographically inside the nation of Israel. He's still inside the land of Israel. He's on, the, he's on the other side of Jordan. He's on the east side of, Ga of Galilee. We know that. And when I, I ran the references on the Gadarenes, and there, there's, no, there's, no, there's not much to go by because they're only mentioned once. They're mentioned uh, here in, 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 in Matthew. But, I mean, they're not mentioned in any other place in your instance in Scripture. And there are all sorts of uh, uh, theories, if you, if, you, you know, if you put much stock in that sort of thing. Uh, one of the theories I'd heard recently was that they were a a uh, um, related to the half tribe of Manasseh, I think was the theory, and I don't know how you derive that. I don't know how you prove that. I mean, you don't have you're not proving it from the Bible, so you're just proving it some other way, I guess, if you're proving it at all. But even then, let's say they're the half tribe of Manasseh, then they're they're still under the Levitical law, and they're not allowed to have, be pig farmers and have pigs. But somebody there had a bunch of pigs, which makes me think another thing. So you remember in Luke sixteen. When the prodigal son says he says he uh, uh, he went off into a far country, well, this is called the country of the Gadarenes. And here you have people here in verse ten, I'm sorry, verse eleven, that are hired to feed pigs. So if you remember when I was talking on a previous podcast, we talked about how Luke sixteen and all other Jesus's parables are in all likelihood, actual true stories of things that actually happened to actual people. So just, just, just humor me for a moment. I have a theory that the prodigal son's, the prodigal son, that he was one of those guys here in Mark. And he's feeding the pigs, he's keeping on the pigs, and Jesus comes by and puts the guy out of a job 
And so he's sitting there on the shoreline looking at a bunch of pig corpses, realizing he longer, no longer has a job, and goes, maybe I should go back to my father's house. I mean, could it be that Jesus was the driving catalyst that encouraged this boy to pack up and go back to the house? I mean, is it possible? So I don't know, man. It's a bit of a stretch. It is a bit of a stretch. I will give you that it is a bit of a stretch, but it's a stretch that I'm comfortable with. So there you go. So the thing you got to think about is like, I talked a minute ago about how the how the um, the spirits, the the devils, the the they were able to successfully run a human body, manipulate, operate a human body. They went straight from a human body to pig bodies. And we're able to operate them good enough to override those pigs' natural survival instincts and drive them to the ocean. To what avail, I have no idea. And I'm assuming that when those pigs expire, those spirits are free to, to do whatever they do in their off time. Uh, it, it's, uh, there, there's, there's, in Mark 5, sometimes it seems like there's more questions than there are answers. But you see in verse 13... I'm sorry, and all the devils besought him, saying, Send us in the, into the swine that we may enter into them. And forthwith Jesus gave them leave, and the unclean spirits went out and entered into the swine. And the herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea. They were about 2,000 and were choked in the sea. And they that fed the fl swine fled and told it in the city and in the country. And they went out to see what it was done, what it was that was done. And they came to Jesus and see him that was possessed with the devil and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. And they saw it, they that saw it told them how it befell to them, him that was possessed with the devil, and also concerning the swine, and they began to pray him to depart out of their coasts. Now, that is a strange reaction. So here you have these, these guys that are literally a public nuisance. Literally, you have you have gone up there, you've taken squads of men, and you have you have picked these fellows up, and you've carried them back to town, and you've chained them up, and they bust loose, and they rip all the clothes off, and they run back in the mountains. And, and it is such a nuisance that people are, are, are not even walking down the road by the graveyard anymore if they can avoid it because they don't want to get harassed by these fellows. And so you would think that just from a, from a perspective of at least we no longer have this public nuisance, that you would be glad that Jesus did this. But they're not. They're not. Because he cost them money. And so people's reactions and things tells you sometimes everything you need to know. When we go out and preach sometimes, we'll, we'll preach at these festivals and we'll preach at these uh, these events. And people will have little booths set up. And I have sympathy towards this sort of thing. Because my wife sometimes will be at some of the festivals and she'll have a little booth set up where she, she makes little things and sells it, whatever. And um, a common uh, complaint among downtown merchants, if you preach downtown someplace in America... You've probably run into this or at these little festivals is that people will say that your preaching is running off the customers. Your preaching is hurting their business. Your preaching is interfering with their ability to make a living. We had that, especially one year in Fernandita Beach, Florida, uh, where a fellow was just straight up. You know, I'm going to have you arrested because you're costing all these all these vendors money and they paid to be here. And it's not fair of you to come down here and disrupt their business. And the guy went on to say, Jesus wants us to make lots of money so we can feed our families. And you're stopping me from feeding my family. It is essentially the same argument in the book of Acts when the guys who made a living making little silver idols of Diana of the Ephesians did not like that Paul the Apostle and others were preaching against Diana of the Ephesians because it hurt their pocketbook. Now, <clears throat> when, it's, when that charge is laid against us, First of all, most of the time, I don't think it's true. I've watched the crowds. I've watched the the people going to the booths. I've watched all that happen while we're preaching, and I don't think we are significantly impacting business at all. Because we we're all, we're we always we always put ourselves out of the path. We stand in a place where people have to go by us, but we're not standing in front of your booth while you're trying to sell your knickknacks and your paddywhacks. We we are off to the side. 
But let's say I was costing you some sales. Let's say in, in the entire week, let's say the Shrimp Festival in Fernandina Beach, Florida, which lasts Friday, Saturday, Sunday. You have hours a day to sell your wares. And for an hour, hour and a half, two hours out of the entire weekend, a couple of guys are down there with signs and, and their voices, their bare voices, no amplification, preaching the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's say that all happens. And let's say for an hour, hour and a half, two hours, your business is less than it could be if we weren't there. Let's say the charge is correct. And let's say that we are hurting your business. How do I say this nicely? So what? Who cares? How much concern did Jesus show towards the pig farmers? They had a legitimate they had a legitimate complaint. He had just cost them a ton of money. And Jesus' attitude, maybe it's it's not fair to put words in Jesus' mouth and say he said, who cares so what? I said, who cares so what? Jesus' position appears to be that that man being delivered was more important than your money and your pigs. After all, the Son of God, who only has a certain set amount of time on this earth to get all the things done that he came here to do. From the minute Jesus is born, the clock is ticking. And he takes at least a day out of however many days he has to go across the ocean, across the sea and to minister to one man, two men, but one man for sure we know gets delivered. And, and to Jesus, that was a worthwhile trip. And so for you to go to Jesus and go, our pigs are worth more than this man. It just shows that you and Jesus are not on the same page. That man being clothed and in his right mind was more important to Jesus than your herd of unclean beasts that your name is supposed to have if you're in Israel. And so there you go. <coughs> clothed in his right mind. I always wonder where the clothes came from, but I, I, have, I have no answer. Uh, we're going to stop there. We're going to next time we're going to pick up. Uh, um, well, actually, yeah, it, it, because the way we recorded this, you've already heard the the one I was, I was about to about to tease a little bit. But we're going to stop there, and uh, that'll that'll take us to a good spot in uh, in, in uh, Mark five to pick up with later. In what will be less than thirty five, I guess. And so, anyway, in the meantime, this is Michael. This is Street Preachers Corner Podcast. All of you that listen, thank you very much. All four of you, and. Um, as always, I will see you on the other side.